Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, a special session of the state legislature results in a new child welfare agency. That new agency is meeting with skepticism from the Attorney General's office. This as the Attorney General's re-election bid draws skepticism from his fellow Republicans. The Journalists Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizons. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Mary Jo Pitzel of the Arizona Republic, Howard Fisher of Capital Media Services, and Ben Giles of the Arizona Capital Times. A special session of the legislature results in a new child welfare agency with a new director and a whole lot of new money. And a lot of new kind of confidence and, and, and optimism. How far does that go? Um, through the campaign season, I would say. <laughs> um, but yesterday, yes, you would, a, a new day had dawned. You know, this, a new sun had come up, and um, the legislature sort of united in this big kumbaya and uh, and approved the policy bill that creates the new Department of Child Safety. And a lot of self congratulations that this is how we should work. This is bipartisan work, and it's important. And we all banded together to do this. There was one dissenting vote on the money part of it. Senator Kelly Ward um, cast the only vote. She had some issues that uh, with uh, trying to tie some improvements to the release of money. She couldn't get those, so she voted against it. I think that the uh, good feelings continue till we have the first Lori Roberts column post July 1, <laughs> post new agency about a dead child. Uh, we have an agency that's refusing to provide records or something despite the new transparency. Uh, it's you know, by the end of the year, we'll, we'll, we'll start hearing, is it, did we do right? Or we'll have the other side of it is, are they taking kids from homes too easily? Which and, is a big fight. And we talked about all week long, we've had you guys on here to kind of give us an update on this. And the, the pendulum, the, uh, the enduring mm -hmm. pendulum mm -hmm. with, with Child Protective Services, in that do you keep the kids in the home, try to keep the family to get, to get the kid out of there in a dangerous situation, it's still going to exist. Exactly, and I think that's why a lot of lawmakers were trying to temper expectations yesterday. There was a lot of uh, like clapping for themselves and patting <laughs> each other on the back, but there was also a lot of this as a process. It's going to take time. Uh, we shouldn't expect child abuse and neglect to disappear overnight just because two bills were signed by the governor yesterday. It's going to be three, four, maybe five years until some of the reforms that they tried to enact are going to take effect. And people need to be patient and remember that. But the question is, as this becomes a yearly topic, how patient are lawmakers going to be after throwing $60 million in this special session and about a quarter of a million dollars at this agency over the last six years? How much patience is there going to be for real change? to start taking effect. Right. Patience and I think and attentiveness because um, <laughs> I think it was both you know, Representative Mesnard and Rep Representative Farnsworth said look you know th these are tough issues you know we didn't want to get dragged into them when we were first pulled into these issues years ago. Uh, it's it's a tough topic it's not comfortable to hear about children you know being put in harm's way. Uh, so the question is is, is there going to be a belief that okay we've, we fixed it now Charles Flanagan and his mm. department go off and do your thing and you don't need to come back to us for for any more money or really much of anything until you get some stuff well, rolling. I'll go a step farther. Legislature is filled with people who are ADD. You know, very short attention span. We've solved that problem. We've stamped it out. What do we go on to next? You know, leaving aside their own election, uh, it'll be the next crisis, the next issue. And, you know, we can only guess as to which agency will come in the be the headlights next. Okay, so how, let's, let's get in general terms here. How does this new agency differ from the old agency? Well, <laughs> a lot of it is a question of what they spo what's supposed to be attitude. It's a culture change. A lot. Some of it is money. Look, the fact is, it's an eight hundred forty-five million dollars spending plan. There should be more caseworkers, lower caseload. Uh, the more important stuff, I think, is the idea of better supervision better oversight, an investigations bureau, so you don't have 6,500 cases that nobody found out about until by accident, really, it was discovered they hadn't been investigated. But they're talking about a culture change there. And some of that comes with the money, with the supervision. I think that when people realize, yes, the state is supporting us, will they stay? The, the, the bonuses at 18 and 36 months, you have more educated caseworkers. I think you have better results, perhaps. So a lot of it is incremental. 
and the idea that Charles Flanagan now is the new director. He will report directly to the governor's office. This is now a separate agency. Makes a difference, but does it make a difference? And yeah, and hopefully that is one of the, the layers of bureaucracy that's been eliminated by taking this out of DES and just making it its own independent agency. Um, but some of the concern is maybe there's faith in, in Governor Brewer and maybe there's faith in Director Flanagan to, to right the ship as much as they can, but there's going to be a new governor in office in January. There's going to be uh, eventually a new director for this agency, and that's why there were some questions about accountability, not just from a, a spending standpoint, but just making sure that these cases are being handled efficiently and in a timely manner. Um, but the other issue that this agency faces, and, and I think the problem that it, it makes this a three to five year fix, is that it still has the burden of all of the problems that CPS has faced for decades. It's still got to fix those issues. The, there's still some, about a thousand or so NI cases to close. There's a near 15,000 case backlog of, of just inactive cases, ones that no one has touched for more and, than 60 days. And 900 coming in a Every, week. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's the issue there, and, right. and, it's, and it's going to take a long time to, to figure it out. Yeah, and Ted, to your question about, you know, how is this different, one, one of the things that the, the new law allows is um, they're going to create what they call a, a needs and risk assessment, and if, if it all goes to form, this should allow caseworkers to have sort of a differential response to, um, to report so that it's not one size fits all. Not everything has to be investigated. Mm, starting to sound a little bit like what, um, you know, a few steps removed from NI, but mm -hmm. it, they want to be able to tailor the solution to the individual situation instead of saying everything must be, you know, thoroughly investigated. And, and these are the things that are going to require the ongoing attentiveness of the legislature because there are still parts of this plan that are being developed. Um, though yeah, that protocol for, for how to handle a case when it's first reported to the hotline, also we're told that they're going to streamline training so that um, right now about 20% of the caseworkers at this agency aren't actually investigating cases because they're still being trained to do so. That process needs to speed up so we can start to eliminate the backlog so they can actually investigate these 900 more cases as they come in every week. Um, and these are things that are still in the process of, of being developed and need some oversight to make sure that they're going to work. And, and there's one more piece of this, which is prevention. Over the last five years, I think something like 200 million accumulated in prevention funds were cut mm -hmm. during the hard times. Now, some of this is subsidized child care to make sure parents don't have to leave the child in a hot car. Some of it is you go into a, a family situation, they, they need some help, some counseling. You don't have the money for that, so you wait until what? It's a $50,000 take the kid out of the home situation. And that's going to require ongoing attention too. Hopefully, as the budget improves, will yeah. those preventive services be addressed? Do you think next session, or will that be <laughs> a hot potato next well, go around? Well, they will definitely be raised, but the um, whether they'll be addressed, you know, who knows what the legislature is going to look like next session? And uh, obviously, as been noted, you know, Governor Brewer is not going to be around. Um, but the plan that she set forth is that, well, hey, we're putting all this money into getting rid of this 15,000 case backlog. As that goes away, the money that's been spent on there theoretically should mm -hmm. shift over to prevention, but that will take legislative action. And we do have a fair number of lawmakers in the current legislature who are skeptical about, you know, is this money well spent? Yeah. All right, and, and now you, you mentioned skepticism. I know the Attorney General's office isn't all that happy about this mm. because they're not, they're supposed to be representing state agencies, and it sounds like this particular agency has got its own lawyers well, working for them. Well, yes and no. To a certain extent, the legislation provides for Mr. Flanagan to have his own consigliere, if you will, uh, a, an attorney he can hire for, for certain advice. But I think some of the routine things, however, uh, may still be handled by the AG's office. The question comes down to, if you hire your own attorney, are you only going to get the advice that you want? Now, the other side of the equation has been that, un, that the Attorney General's office, every time we've asked for public records, a lot of it has been us. They've, the Attorney General's office has taken the very cautious approach, oh, we can't provide them with anything. We'd run afoul of federal laws. Well, no. 
if you're not releasing the name, if you're not releasing identifying information, you can provide us details of abused children and beaten children and dead children. And the AG's office has been a little reticent, which is why I think Flanagan thinks if he's going to have public support, he better darn well have that information out there. Is there a concern, though, and it sounds like underneath the, the, the concerns of the AG's office, that perhaps the DCS, as we're calling it now, the mm -hmm. DCS, built too much around Charles Flanagan? Uh, a little bit. <laughs> it, Charles Flanagan does have this um, sort of overwhelming gung-ho personality, and I think uh, there's some lawmakers who, who have some concerns about that. Bob Worsley said he, Senator Bob Worsley said he met with uh, Charles Flanagan and some of the governor's staff on Wednesday night before these bills were uh, voted out and signed, and, and, and actually addressed that, that there's this relationship, a, a direct relationship now between the director, Flanagan, and between the governor's office. That is a strong relationship, but uh, again, Governor Brewer isn't uh, going to be in office much longer. What's the relationship that Flanagan will have with the new governor or the new director? And should there be some sort of buffer between those two? Should, should Flanagan be reporting to someone else, perhaps the legislature? Well, th but it's, it's hard to, um, from some national child welfare experts that we spoke to, it's hard to legislate how to do this. I mean, a lot does mm -hmm. depend on the style, on the administrator. Mm -hmm. and. You know, so whether it's Charles Flanagan or whomever will at some point be his successor, you've got to leave, you, you can't nail everything down in statute or you're going to have cookie cutter kind of approach and that's been a problem for, and, for CPS. And that suggests tinkering as we move along. And oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and that is why a lot of the, the policy bill that creates this new agency gives the director some broad latitude to uh, to create policies, to make changes yeah. within the agency. And uh, that's a, a little scary for some lawmakers who uh, don't think there's enough accountability in the new agency, who want to see a return on this three-quarter of a billion dollar investment into child safety that they're making. Um, but on the flip side, the argument is you need the flexibility um, to change the culture of that agency, to change the way cases are handled. But it's all going to come down to where we started, which is we're going to start seeing are the number of cases being reported reduced? Is the backlog going away? Are we ending up with more dead children? And to the extent that uh, there's a little love fest, the cult of personality, if you will, with, with Mr. Flanagan, uh, that all goes away if he doesn't produce and produce really soon. Yeah. All right. Uh, um, well, I, and to go back to the um, Attorney General's objections, yes. another concern that that office had besides the issue of uh, uh, Flanagan getting an in-house counsel is they're saying, hey, we need we need money. If you're going to put more caseworkers on there, the law says if you're going to take a kid out of the house, uh, out of their home, they've got to get before a judge within 72 hours. To do that, you need an attorney. Mm -hmm. um, and no, they're arguing that they need more resources to hire more attorneys because they believe more caseworkers will result in more court action. Um, mm -hmm. The counter argument is that we'll know if, if, if the state gets in there early enough and intervenes and has a way to do a differentiated kind of response, maybe you don't have to remove a kid, mm -hmm. therefore you can save some costs. But that remains to be seen as they, again, march through 15,000 cases, you know, that have just haven't yeah. had any attention for at least 60 days. Th there's going to be, there's going to be a couple of minefields in there. And, and that is a result that a lot of lawmakers would like to see. And I think a lot of the, the child welfare community in Arizona would like to to see is a move away from having uh, a child removed from their home being uh, uh, maybe the go-to remedy for some of these cases. They'd like to see preventative care increased so it never gets to that point. Uh, and then even then they'd like to find more permanent solutions for a home for these children rather than having them in foster care and group homes, which um, Arizona I, I think ranks highest among yes. some states for the use of foster care. And we should mention reports are that the governor's office uh, advised the attorney general's office to not make a problem over this or oh. political retribution. Will, do they need to give any political retribution to the attorney general right well, now? Well, the, Scott Smith wrote a little note to Rick Bistro, who is a Horn's chief deputy, and basically said, I don't mean to be a jerk. He actually used those words. But if you don't back off, there will be, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes. you know we have, they have to hurt you. Um, look, Horn's office, Horn himself has been under a lot of scrutiny. We've talked about that week after week here. Uh, he's got a, some uh, responses due on Monday on the latest set of complaints about whether he's using his office for political purposes. Uh, you know, 
I, Horn doesn't need new attention, or perhaps he's, he's taking a position on DCS, figuring if it falls apart, look, I told you so, and here he is focusing on something other than his problems. Well, his problems now include nine state lawmakers delivering a letter to the Attorney General's office uh, asking him to please don't oh, run come again. On. I'm sorry. Look, they are not saying it's one thing to have Barry Goldwater and John Rhodes go to Richard Nixon and say, please resign for the good of the country because, you know, you cannot govern or because you've committed crimes. These lawmakers, Matt Salmon, the rest of them, I don't think they care one whit whether Tom Horn is guilty or not of the, of the things accused. This is pure politics. We don't want to lose to, God forbid, have a Democrat attorney general, and that's all this is. Well, and we talked about this last week, the sense of Matt Salmon, at least at the time, uh, Congressman Salmon, basically what he was worried about was turning the office over to the Democrats when I would imagine most folks are saying you should be worried about the fact that these allegations are there. And the letter we should mention, the letter mentioned a dark cloud of impropriety hangs over you, your ability to serve the public is severely compromised, these sorts of but, 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 but not so much that they, they should leave now. It's no, they not, don't want him to that, run for re-election. But that's the point. If, there were, right. if he could not run the office, then you say, leave now. They're not saying that. They're saying, complete the term, because we sure, you know, we, we'd, we'd like somebody to stay in there who's a Republican who we can count on, but just don't run again and pave the way for Mark Brnovich to be the Republican nominee. Yeah, this is just, you know, it's... it's an attempt to do death by a thousand cuts. I mean, I assume we will probably see calls like this weekly for <laughs> a matter <laughs> throughout the summer. But, you know, as I think Ben wanted to point out, not all lawmakers think this is a bad idea. Yes, Ben, uh, please. For the same reasons that you have uh, nine <laughs> Republicans asking Horn to not run for re-election, you have just about every Democrat <laughs> in the state voicing their support for Tom Horn because they see him as the weaker of the two GOP candidates for that office. Mark Burnovich is, um, is considered to be someone who could win against Felicia Rodolini, the Democrat, if those two were the ones who wound up in the general election for, G for the attorney general. So Democrats are saying, please, Tom Horn, please stay in this race, mm -hmm. win the GOP primary, because then Felicia Rodolini can beat you, and we've got a Democrat in the statewide office. And we should mention that uh, Attorney General Horn will be on the program here on Tuesday next week, and he will be answering questions regarding all he was supposed to be on her a couple of weeks ago, but mm -hmm. he wanted to wait to file his complaint and after that. So he will be on uh, to do that. Uh, Howie, uh, a former governor, came to the Attorney General's aid in, in a way. What was that all about? Well, the, the back story on this is there is an ad, and if you've been watching TV at all, you've had a hard time missing it, basically saying Tom Horn cheats on his wife, uh, followed by the FBI, uh, hit and run, um, you know, questioning his parentage, the whole, the whole routine. And it's been run as an educational campaign by a group, uh, was Arizona? Public Integrity Public Alliance. Integrity Alliance, a wonderful sounding yes. name. Fact is, under federal law and under Arizona law, if you are not trying to influence an election, you don't have to register, you don't have to disclose the source of your money. Now, I think somebody may be trying to influence an election, but what I think doesn't matter. What matters is the courts have set up tests. You start off with magic words, vote for, vote against, support, oppose. But there's a long line of case law on this. Look at the things running on Congress. Call Congresswoman Kirkpatrick and tell her about something. Same sort of ad. You're educating people on a person's voting record. So when, the, when former Governor Symington says this makes a mockery of campaign laws, no regulation, no registration, no disclosure of donors, it's an unprecedented dark money campaign, um, <laughs> does it mean all that much? Um, well, it certainly highlights the issue of dark money, and I don't know if it's unprecedented because we had some dark money playing in two um, ballot initiatives in 2012, but because he is a former governor, because mm -hmm. he's Fife Symington, he's raising the, the awareness level, he has the ability to do that and point out that maybe this isn't all above board, and if you've got a problem with Tom Horn, then just come clean and say who you are, you know, and, and stand behind your, your message. Well, it would have been nicer if, if the, the former governor had come out during the legislative session when they were tinkering with the idea of maybe doing some regulation and come down to the Capitol and said, here, I have an idea, I have a draft that we can close up some of the loopholes, but 
Do we, do where we, was five? Do we know why he's bringing this up now? I mean, is, are, are his folks aligning themselves with, with Horn and against Horn? What, what's going on behind I, the scenes it, it, it's, it's hard to know. I, I mean, I've got one theory that, you know, remember, Fife Simonton was the first person to call on Evan Meekham to resign. And all of a sudden, when Fife was on the, uh, on the, the shoe was on the other foot, all of a sudden he said, well, that was bad. Maybe he feels that you should be allowed to have your issues played out before you're forced out. All right, we have about 30 seconds left. Rick Murphy is not running for re-election. He's running for Peoria City Council. <laughs> yeah, he said he had a, a, a change of heart. He wants to go in a new direction. And uh, really what this is about is uh, Representative Debbie Lesko choosing to run against him in District 21. Um, Rick Murphy has some ongoing issues with CPS. He was investigated by the Peoria Police Department for allegations that he, uh, he molested two children in his care. Um, there were never any charges, the, the case is ongoing, but it was enough of a drag that uh, Debbie Lesko thought, maybe I'd better run, so again, we have a safe GOP seat, similar to uh, Tom yes. Horn, mm. um, and, and it's an it's easier race. Yeah. And interestingly, probably his very last vote as a lawmaker was the vote to create the new yes. child welfare agency. Well, all right. We'll wrap it up right there. Good to have you all here. Thanks for joining us. Monday on Arizona Horizon, the latest on the Veterans Affairs scandal, which started with allegations regarding the Phoenix VA hospital. And we'll hear about a new wildfire prevention campaign for the summer. That's on Monday's Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.